Hello, everyone. It's me again. Welcome to the U.S. Center and welcome to our NASA Hyperwall Talk. Very excited to have Dr. Wen Ying Su, the senior research scientist at NASA Langley Research Center, talk about sea level rise and the Earth's water cycle. Thank you all. Uh, welcome to U.S. Center today. Uh, I'm going to present some of the NASA observing capabilities, uh, how we track the sea level and the water cycle. So the probably the most uh, uh, observable signs of the global climate change is the rising seas. So we're all here to, uh, at the call because the global temperature has been rising uh, for the last few decades. And with that change, with the warming, there's a lot of uh, other uh, consequences. One of those are the um, losing, losing of the sea ice, the uh, glaciers, and the, uh, the uh, ice sheets. With those water that melted, and then they are just adding the volume to the ocean, so that caused sea level rise. Uh, as the world warms, it also the water uh, expands in the ocean. That's also causing the sea level to rise. So with the uh, NASA, we have been observing the global ocean for the last three decades. With the uh, launch of Topax Poseidon in 1992, uh, uh, continue with the whole suite of missions uh, uh, until uh, the launch of a SWAT mission of last year. So we have like many missions that are keeping track of the uh, the ocean surface height. With those data, we actually can see how the uh, global ocean surface height has been changing over the last 30 years. So this is the uh, graph shows the global average sea surface uh, height changing over the last 30 years. You can see from 1993 to 2022, you can see this. Uh, it's very clear that the global sea level has been rising in, uh, steadily. And the other alarming fact is that the sea ice, uh, uh, global sea ice level increasing has been accelerating in the last decade also. And this is the graph shows actually the regional distribution of the global sea, uh, sea level. Uh, the uh, bluish color means that the, uh, the, uh, the sea level in 2022 is actually lower than that of 93. Uh, the warm, uh, Yellowish, uh, reddish color means the global sea level actually higher uh, than that in 1993. You can see actually there's very little blue in this whole globe, which means that the entire globe has been higher the, uh, now than, um, than in 92. So for us living along the U.S. coast, it's even, wor uh, even worse for us because the, uh, the sea level along the U.S. coast is actually rising faster than the global average. So on average, uh, I have to mention that the sea level has been risen like for 10 centimeters just in the last three decades, 10 centimeters. So why do we care? What's the consequence of sea level rise? Because that's where most of us live. I don't know how many of you are coming from the coastal region. I know this gentleman is from Hong Kong. <laughs> I'm also from a coastal area. So I guess at least according to the UN uh, Ocean Atlas, 44% of the world population lives within 150 kilometers of the coast. That's a lot of people, lots of people. So sea level rise means that most of us will lose our home. And also our, most of the... Um, economic drivers along the coast because that's where the ports are and also the infrastructure are there. So I think this eight of the uh, 10 largest city over the world is along the coast also. So that means it's a huge impact because with the sea level rise it will be a more um, storm surge, more flooding, and more mitigations needed to, uh, to accommodate all this. So that's why sea level rise is really kind of affects a lot of people in many ways that we can't imagine. This is the uh, SWAT satellite I just mentioned on my uh, first slides. Uh, which is the surface water and ocean topography uh, satellite. This is the mission that we just launched a year ago. It's a collaboration between NASA and the, uh, the uh, uh, 
French Space uh, uh, Agency and also with the contributions from the Canadian Space Agency and the UK Space Agency. It's a state-of-the-art uh, radar interferometry measurement and together with the, uh, with the um, altimeter mission. So you can see that this is a fully deployed uh, the satellite uh, visualization. The, uh, the, um, the radar interferometer uh, data can actually measure the elevation of water surface, will provide us uh, uh, information on the uh, elevation of the water, will give us a lot of information on where the waters are over land, and will also help us track the regional sea level change, also study the coastal process, <laughs> And this information will be very helpful for us to understand the uh, water storage and for local communities to, uh, to, um, to plan, you know, where, where, if there's a drought coming or uh, floods coming. And also will help us understand what's the changing climate's impact on uh, water resources, on, um, and how that affects our precipitation with the oldest, you know, extreme precips coming and how that affects the local community. At the end of uh, the simulation, you can see that the data just fills up the whole entire globe. It takes about 21 days. Sorry. Okay. It takes about 21 days for uh, to, to get a global coverage of all the uh, entire ocean and and uh, and and land. So I should mention this takes about 21 days uh, for us to take the entire uh, observation of the whole globe. This is the first uh, global composite of uh, sea surface height uh, image. This is the data taken just over the summer in uh, the time frame of June and August. Uh, that's the first uh, uh, image that we collected from uh, SWAT mission. What I'm showing here is the anomaly of global sea surface height. What the, uh, the yellow and reddish color means that local sea surface height is higher than that of the uh, average uh, sea surface height. The bluish means that's lower than the global mean sea surface height. You can see there's uh, lots of variations uh, of the sea surface height around the globe. This is basically caused by the ocean topography and the currents. So you can see some of the currents coming off the, uh, the Gulf Coast and also coming off of Japan. You can also see that uh, in the equatorial Pacific Ocean, there's a warm water bands. That's uh, basically the onset of the El Nino because during El Nino, the ocean surface water is really warm there. When the water is warm, it kind of expands. So that's why the local sea surface height is higher than that of the global mean. So this is the um, uh, image over the Alaska uh, Yukon Delta uh, region. So you can see this is the uh, big um, river flow through here. That's the Yukon Delta uh, Yukon River, and also you can see a lot of those small uh, uh, lakes that's probably observed on this space for the first time. Uh, the color there are corresponding to the uh, the height of the water. So this observation actually gave you a three dimensional view, so that can give you an, uh, an concept of how much water is in the river. So that's really provide critical information that uh, uh, for the uh, local water resource management to prepare for uh, floods and droughts. Uh, that's uh, the critical information that we'll need to, uh, to prepare the uh, community uh, for, for water resource management. So as the ocean warms, there's other, many other uh, impacts that comes with this. You know, there's uh, uh, acidification. Uh, there's also o ocean uh, dead zone as well. This image shows the, uh, the photoplankton distribution within our global ocean. The uh, photoplanktons are those tiny little plants within the ocean. They're absorbing CO2 just like plants on the, uh, on the, on the land, just through the photosynthesis process. 
So what we're showing here is the um, simulation of the global photoplankton distribution. Uh, so with the uh, different colors, like the uh, red and uh, yellowish color means that's a fairly large size photoplankton, and the cyan and the green means smaller size of photoplankton. And you can see that distribution changes. And this is uh, uh, critically needed information for us to understand the uh, ocean carbon cycle and how that supply the, uh, uh, the uh, food for the other ocean ecosystems. So we've been uh, tracking how this uh, uh, photoplankton changes in the ocean for many years. So we have many other satellites, but we want to keep uh, monitoring this uh, important parameter. Uh, so we will have another satellite that will be launched the next year that call plankton, aerosol, cloud, and uh, ecosystem, ocean ecosystem. So what this animation shows is that how we observing different components, those different components that work together for us to understand how this are interconnected, how we understand the, uh, you know, the carbon exchange between the atmosphere and the ocean. Besides the ocean ecosystem, this uh, also gave you some uh, measurements of the aerosols and the clouds in the, uh, in the entire Earth's atmosphere system. So that can, this information we got can actually feed into the models that can uh, get with a better understanding of the, uh, the, the entire Earth's atmosphere system. I want to circle back to this, uh, uh, you know, visualization that I showed at the beginning of the talk. So that basically shows the global uh, sea level anomalies for the last uh, 30 years. Basically, that wherever you see this uh, red and yellow shade, that means that your sea level is higher now than in uh, three decades ago. So you can, and blue means that it's lower than three decades ago. You don't really see any, I mean, you still see a little bit blue, but most of the, the globe is covered in the red and yellow shade. That means that, you know, we are seeing an unprecedented global sea level uh, rise. Uh, like I mentioned, that's on the average about 10 centimeters in the last three decades. So how much and how quickly sea level rise will continue in the future, that depends on the choice we make now. This the figure shows the uh, uh, sea level rise projection uh, along the U.S. Uh, uh, contiguous U.S. coastlines. So the dash line down here uh, is from 1920 to uh, 2020. That's uh, based on the uh, observation. So this is line you can see that I already talked about that. So it's been ri rising about uh, 10 centimeter in the last three decades. So, but the I want you to focusing on all those different color lines around here. Those are based on the you know uh, the projections based on different emission scenarios. Depends on how much. Uh, CO2s or the other greenhouse gases we're going to keep pumping into our uh, atmospheres and your global sea level rises is on a very different trajectory uh, along 2100. So on the graph on the uh, on this side, so basically that uh, gave you a summary of uh, what's the um, projected sea level rise depends on different global uh, warming levels along the U.S. coastline. So basically, if you have a two degree sea warming levels uh, in 2100, the, um, the sea level will be about two to three feet higher along the U.S. coast uh, compared to what we have in 2000. But of course, if you add more warming, your sea level will be even higher and higher. So which translate into more people losing the uh, livelihood, the home, and uh, we have relocate more infrastructures, and that will really affect most of us, most of people's livelihood, and um, that will translate into more cost for adaptation. So our choices doesn't matter. With that, I'll take any questions you may have. I also want to mention this is from the figures from our uh, U.S. Uh, Fifth National uh, Climate Assessment, which was just released about a month ago. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Hi. Uh, 
Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I just have a question. Is there like a uh, uh, supplementary sensors in the air that you use uh, for the data collection? Data connection for the sea level? Yeah. No, this all data was all continuous, so we have uh, that uh, since 92. So that will give you a 30-year time series, so you can look at the, uh, you know, the how the sea surface height changed over the past thir uh, three decades. We have a sea level um, rise portal in NASA, if you just uh, look at that. So there will be all the data, and they have all the assessment, all the projection tools on the web page, and also the animations that I showed is also on that web page. You can, uh, you can actually take a look. And all this data are open and free uh, to download in the, yeah, so if you have any questions, there will be each uh, data center will have a contact information that you can actually write them and they will help you with the data uh, access and analysis. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Pretty novice at this, so I'll ask a silly question. Um, is this additional water to raise, uh, use the example of maybe two feet, um, is it all from ice melt or is it because temperature rises or uh, what, where is the water source to raise the ocean? That's a huge amount of water. Yes. And again, I'm assuming a lot of it's ice melt, but what else? Yeah, so there's uh, two, uh, mainly two factors. Uh, one thing is uh, the, because the, you, you, uh, you worm the, uh, the earth, right? So you, uh, ice sheets melting, your glaciers disappearing, your sea ice is also disappearing. So those uh, melted waters adds to the ocean, right? So if you just pour a bucket, uh, uh, in your pools, you know, in your whatever containers, and then you, you will, the water level will increase. That's one factor. The other factor is, when you heat up the water, because the, uh, the, as the world warms, the ocean actually take up most of the heat. 93% of the the uh, the uh, the, energy, the uh, global warming is are trapped in the ocean. So the, as the ocean warms, and it also expands, that actually also uh, lift up the ocean. So I think the uh, relatively speaking, about two thirds. The uh, sea ice uh, uh, level, uh, sea, sea level rise is coming from the melting of those uh, glaciers and sea ice, and about one third is coming from the thermal expansion of the part. Thank you for that question. A couple of questions. First, do you, do you know why um, sea level rise seems to be more prevalent along the U.S. coast? And then also, I was just noticing that a lot of those data are in bands uh, along, around the Earth. But what, what impact would the change in ocean currents have on this? Because ocean currents go, you know, all around, but most of the data looked like it was in bands, so. Okay, so first question is uh, the, you, you, can you repeat your first question? Yeah, why do you think that um, the, the sea level rise is more prevalent along the U.S.? Coast? Oh, okay. So that has a lot to do with the, with the ocean currents as well. So because, you know, like it has to do, uh, once, for example, like a redistribution, you know, the gravity redistribution was so, like, for example, the um, melting of the, uh, the uh, Antarctic ice sheets actually have more impact on, along the U.S. coast. That's because of the, the uh, redistribution of those masses. And then the, uh, the figure I think if you, I'm remembering what you are saying is the one that uh, found the first, from the first uh, uh, SWAT mission, that's like the uh, the sea surface height anomaly. That's not a long-term change. That's just like a, a change, for example, where you have ocean topography and the currents. That's like a, a, where you, uh, uh, those bands are, you have higher uh, water, sea, sea, uh, sea surface height than the global average. That's not like a time series change. It's more like a relative to what's the global average of that three weeks. So that also has something to do with the currents and ocean topography. And also where you have those uh, uh, El Nino or La Nino. So El Nino is basically the regional warming of the, uh, the equatorial Pacific. That's uh, along the, the, the east, eastern part. So that's also when I mentioned when the water warms, that actually expands. So that's also have the local sea surface tide is higher than uh, you know, the rest of the ocean. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you for that question. Yeah, so that's a um, very good question. So that's all. Oh, this is a, we have a call, something called interagency uh, sea level rise task force within the U.S. So this uh, projections, and then uh, what I'm showing here is just sort of like the average along the uh, contiguous U.S. coastline. But we also have regional maps. So this is the maps that are actually very useful for uh, adaptation, right? For future planning, where you put your infrastructure. Right, so that's uh, like if you're like uh, within, if like for example we're seeing that there will be high uh, tidal right and high flooding possibility, so you probably don't want to put your next infrastructure there. So there's been uh, uh, lots of uh, collaboration with the local communities and pl uh, for planning uh, where you know you put your next uh, infrastructures, for example. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? All right, if no more questions, have a round of applause. Thank you.